Yeah, thanks, Dr. Das. I hope everybody can hear me. So the reason uh, I contacted uh, Dr. Murthy, uh, I hope he can hear me, is that uh, uh, we are taking this work, which we published in Nature, the concept of flower win and lose. Uh, basically, we have what we have identified is a self fitness marker. Uh, so we have fit cells in our body and unfit cells in our body, and flower lose can be a marker for unfit cells. And the reason we reconnected was because uh, we are currently working very rampantly uh, at a massive scale with international collaborations on COVID-19. So COVID-19 concept, which we are trying to project that uh, virus is killing uh, at, at a very unit level. This is killing at the unit level by selectively eliminating the cells of the lung tissue. And uh, the data also is showing that comorbidities and age is a factor in this. So our research, along with the time we were making uh, efforts to uh, get flower coat, uh, you know, testing this hypothesis, we also tested lung ca cancer samples. And along with the lung, we tested normal lung samples. And we found that there is a correlation with accumulation of these bad isoforms of flower in people who have uh, you know, aged uh, more than 65, 75, it keeps going up. In addition, smokers had it up. In addition, people who were taking chemotherapy. So we kind of floated the hypothesis that uh, depending on the level of flower loose in the body, COVID-19 has an ability to selectively eliminate the lung cells. And uh, imagine a lung which is healthy or a lung which is a lung, uh, which has a mix of these cells. It's very easy for the virus to eliminate the suboptimal cells before it eliminates the healthy cells. Uh, and flower loose is a marker for suboptimal cells. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, but I'm going to present the concept uh, first. <clears throat> so cell competition where we have identified flower as a component is basically a group of cells which are living together have to compete for nutrients. Uh, it, they have to compete uh for growth they have to compete for space they have to compete for growth signals uh and the outcome of this is that the fit cells will survive cells which have a tremendous growth potential uh will outcome uh, these constraints so if these red cells they're suboptimal they're diseased they are recognized by the surrounding cells and they are pushed towards apoptosis. And this is the way in which the general homeostasis of the tissue is maintained. So basically, all of us, uh, when we look at the faces, uh, we, with the graying of the hair, we, with the baggy eyes, we can kind of an analyze what is the fitness level, age, uh, and competence of this person. Uh, and accordingly, we make decisions. Uh, what we are trying to come forward as a hypothesis and now test it is that this is also a mechanism which cells adopt. They kind of analyze the surrounding cells and make decisions of interactions accordingly. Yes. This was first observed in Drosophila wing discs uh, in 1975 uh, by playing with a mutation in gene called minute. And that gene plays with ribogenesis. So cells with minute mutations couldn't divide very well. Later on, MIC, the transcription factor, also had some role it, we all know it has a role in controlling the division potential. So in the drosophila wing discs, if there is a situation where the green cells have low MIC and the background blue cells in the wing disc have high MIC, over course of time, plays with division potential. So low MIC means low division potential. You cannot keep up and lose this kind of competition be between cells with low division potential and high division. Later on, some other genes like uh, minute RAS, DPP, HIPPO, they were also found to play some role in this. So from this, uh, in 2009-10, uh, Drosophila study with our collaborators, uh, these cells which were dying, they were sequenced. And one of the genes which was found to be upregulated in these dying cells was CG6151 and was found to be a gene which has three isoforms. Uh, in Drosophila, very different. The N terminal region of this isoform and then the second and third exon was uh, very similar, uh, but the C terminal regions were different. And out of these three, one isoform UB was expressed 
throughout the body of the drosophila whereas loose a and loose b were only found in the cells which were getting eliminated with low mech <clears throat> so based on all the data 2009 in developmental cell we proposed a hypothesis that if there are two cells in the drosophila wing disc both have this ub isoform they live together happily if there are two cells which have this loose isoform they live together happily but if there is a cell with ub and there is a cell with loose coexisting this cell will die <clears throat> so that was a little study which was there in the drosophila and then uh, our group took up the challenge uh, to see if this can have function uh, and simulation and role in human system so we found the ortholog of this gene cg6151 in humans it was on chromosome number 9 open reading frame 7 and uh, <clears throat> exon number 1 exon number 2 were conserved it has four isoforms exon number 3 had uh, presence in two of the isoforms exon number 4 was conserved Ex exon 5 again had presence in two isoforms and then c terminus was very conserved and uh, you can see that it's an active promoter it's not a uh, silent gene and DNA uh, cluster analysis shows that every exon there is active transcription. You see, 100 vertebrates is very conserved. Exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, 4. <clears throat> and specifically, exon 5 is very conserved in uh, higher mammals like uh, chimpanzees, rhesus, etc. So, we did some structure and analysis. This is supposed to sit on the membrane, uh, this protein extracellular and two of the isoforms flower one and flower three which don't have exon three the n-terminal region starts from outside so this is flipped this starts from outside and the other two isoforms where exon three is present this third exon is present the n-terminal region is flipped inside so i'm mentioning exon three because exon three is the key actually in all this and this flipping of n-terminal region outside and inside is also a key so we came up with a strategy where we can achieve something which drosophila people can achieve drosophila people have a lot of genetic tools and they can achieve a, a position or a or a situation where cells which don't divide very fast like green cells can be juxtaposed with cells which divide at a normal rate or fast enough like the blue cells how do we achieve that in humans so we took a strategy we took a decently dividing cell line of breast cancer origin memory cancer 7 mcf and we use crispers to knock flower gene out so we we got the flower knockout cells <clears throat> second thing we did is that we have four isoforms of flower so we created eight vectors four where flower one two three four isoforms will have a rfp tag with it not tag where the protein will be tagged with rfp but uh, one vector will produce RFP as well as the flower because it has an internal ribosomal result. So this vector will give us uh, the GFP, then it has an IRS sequence and then will give us the gene of our interest, the flower. So essentially, we can make lentiviruses out of this and this is the flower knockout cell and we can make this cell express flower one, two, three, four, along with the green color. And in another Petri dish, we can make, again, flower one, two, three, four, uh, along with the red color. So we can test all the permutation combinations of all the flower isoforms uh, mixing together. So we let the cells be transfected for 24 hours, and then we sort them with flow cytometry to select the cells which are uh, expressing our protein of interest. Then we start a uh, imaging process for 24 hours after they are co-culture for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So a uh, heads everyone that cells which are expressing flower one and flower three, when co-cultured with cells expressing flower two and four always die. So we can try all the permutation combination, flower one in green, flower one in red, flower one in green, flower two in red, uh, flower one in green, flower three in red, and similarly flower four in green. So all permutation combinations were tried. And the results were that cells which express flower two and flower four, they don't die. Cells which express flower one and flower three, whenever they are in presence of flower two or flower four, they die. So based on this, uh, we could classify these four isoforms of flower into two interesting categories. 
the category where the entire minus region is starting from outside. This probably is the signaling domain for death. These uh, cells undergo apoptosis. And when the N terminus is flipped inside, these cells have a proliferative signal. Now I'm going to demonstrate this uh, in a very good movie uh, created by uh, Dr. Aisha Madan, uh, where you can see, let me play this from the beginning again, where you can see the flower one is coped to the GFP, where cells are green and red is with RFP. You can see over a course of time with interaction, cells expressing flower one they get hooked into onto cells expressing flower two. And just on basis of expression differences on flower win and lose, the cells expressing flower lose undergo apoptosis. These cells are exactly same. They have uh, no genetic differences other than expressing two different isoforms of a same gene. Uh, and there's no external stimuli either. So this is the first demonstration of human cells competing, uh, where based on the genetic mark, one cell can identify and eliminate a suboptimal cell because these cells are not suboptimal. They are just expressing a marker for the suboptimal cell, but that marker is enough for apoptosis. This is another high resolution movie created by another very talented postdoc, Dr. Chris Pelham in our lab, where you can see this, this time we have flipped the uh, marks where now the flower one, the loose is in red and flower two, the green, uh, is the win isoform and you can see this two cells are happy healthy and then this cell also undergoes division but then they are recognized and just hounded and then eliminated you see it has been broken down into debris basically again the demonstration that flower loose cells can be recognized and eliminated by the flower win cells so what happens uh, if you co-culture flower win with flower win like in this gfp uh, and RFP both are flower win. Nothing happens. Like they can coexist together nicely. Uh, if the cells uh, are plated very far, for example, in this case, this is flower win. Lose cells, they should die. And these are the win cells, they should be killing. But if they are plated very far, there is no physical contact between these cells, then none of that is, uh, is observed. So physical contact between uh, these cells is very critical for this process to undergo. And there are all permutation combinations. But one thing interesting is that if you overexpress flower one, two, three, four uh, in any channel, a green or red uh, iris vector, nothing happens to the cells. They're healthy. So a win cell must be in contact with a loose cell for this to get triggered. If you keep overexpressing flower, and this process is also caspase dependent. So here, flower one and flower one both are in co culture which shouldn't be expressing any death because both are the same isoform. But here, flower two is in RFP. The win is in RFP and lose is in uh, GFP. But if we put the caspase inhibitors, it blocks this process. There's no death observed. So it's a caspase dependent process. And then we also uh, confirmed this with the uh, image stream where after 24 hours, we flow cytometrically analyzed and captured images uh, of this uh, data. So, <clears throat> Another very interesting data we got is that if we take cancer cells uh, and we extract primary epithelial cells and fibroblasts from the breast tissue uh, from patients, and we co-culture these cancer cells which are expressing flower when isoform with normal cells which are existing in the body. Over a course of time, they start killing the normal. Uh, for example, this is a monoculture where like they are sitting in their own petri dishes, primary epithelial fibroblast and vein expressing, there's no death. But if you co-culture a primary epithelial cell with the flower vein cell, the epithelial cell by fourth, fifth, sixth day starts showing apoptosis. Same is with fibroblasts. Cancer cell has the ability to eliminate the normal cells in the surrounding, basically. So that's where we present our hypothesis, which has direct implications on cancer. So if the, this green cell has a problem, it has an oncogenic mutation, ideally it should have been recognized by the yellow cells and it should have been eliminated. But if this green cell cheats the system by a flower or some other mechanisms and, uh, and sends a signal of super fitness to the surrounding cells, instead of, instead of having the marks of suboptimal, like a loose mark, if it's, if it's cheating the system and projecting to the surrounding cells that I am the winner, and I have the propensity to proliferate, uh, then what it will do is induce apoptotic signals because it's a relative competition 
phenotype. It will induce apoptotic signals in the surrounding cells. And in these surrounding cells, if they are eliminated, what you will have is a primary field cancerization. Uh, with this primary field cancerization, uh, that is the first uh, step for a clinically relevant cancer. As you can see, most of the solid tumors uh, have a scenario which is presented like this, where tumor is juxtaposed to a stroma. And for this tumor to grow, it has to eliminate the cells in this region. That's how it's going to create space and grow. Uh, on a polyp, it will grow outside. But in an internal organ cancer, pancreatic, uh, colon, uh, ovarian, breast, it needs to grow in this direction. So there is internal pressure on the tissue, but ultimately there has to be elimination for this to become uh, metastatic and uh, growthful. So uh, we analyzed the and tested the hypothesis in uh, cancer uh, samples of multiple origins, where we took breast, colon, lung, uh, normal tissue, and we realized that expression of flower is very, very poor in uh, normal body. In benign tumors, both win and lose isoforms are, were still low in expression, but compared to the normal tissue, there was an upregulation, specifically of uh, the win isoforms in the tumor and lose isoforms in the stroma. So this is a strategy we adopted. This is cancer of can be of any origin. And then we can laser capture the tumor and the juxtaposed stroma. So we can understand the expression of flower win and lose in the tumor tissue. And we can also understand the expression of flower win and lose in the stroma tissue. And uh, we can make a determination if tumor is per se a win uh, carrying system and the micro environment or the stroma is per se a loose carrying system. This data is represented in this. So we have 25 breast cancer samples, 21 colon samples, and some lung and squamous cell carcinoma. This is the cancer tissue, i.e. laser captured from here. And the win isoforms are overexpressed in multiple cancer types. So it's a very universal phenomena which cuts across uh, uh, genetic heterogeneity, cuts across uh, tumor-specific marks. And if you move to the stromal tissue, the tumor microenvironment, the win isoforms drop significantly and the loose isoforms are up. So in this one thing is to notice that compared to the normal tissue, both win and lose are up. So there is a transcriptional networking happening uh, both in the tumor and the microenvironment. Uh, this was demonstrated very well by another very talented Japanese postdoc in the lab, Masaki, where he performed uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Means this was a tough experiment to get done. Uh, but he could manage this where you can see that in the breast cancer, uh, flower win is occupying the tumor tissue and none of it is present. So this is the area of the tumor and, and it is very specific to the tumor tissue. But in the normal breast, it's hardly available. And this is a very sensitive test. It can pick a, like a single or two copies of the RNA. So the next experiment which we planned was to see so what is the range of this flower system to work? Till when will the flower lose and win partner for whatever their role is? So we laser captured every 200 micrometer from the edge of the tumor. So we went deep into the stroma. And when we captured this tissue, we wanted to understand what is the expression of flower here, 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 as we go farther from the tissue. So we realized that this zero to 400 micron area next to the tumor is a very critical zone, very volatile zone, which actually has a huge role in determine, determining the fate of the tumor. So we understood expression of a number of apoptotic, anti-apoptotic genes. And as you can see here, between zero to 200 and 200 to 400 microns from the edge of the tumor, most of these genes were dancing around very rapidly. Uh, there was a lot of volatility in both the anti-apoptotic and pro-apoptotic genes. And same was the flower expression. As you can see, flower lose, which is coded in the blue, was very high in uh, breast cancer and colon cancer in 0 to 400. So this is, this is, a, this is a phenomena which is actually rimming the tumor. Uh, it is all around the tumor in the microenvironment, wherever the stroma is present. And it probably plays a role in a push-pull kind of, like it's a tug of war. The winner takes it all. If the cancer side is able to eliminate uh, the microenvironment, it will keep growing. But if there is a possibility for creating resistance back to the cancer side, uh, this can also stop tumor growth. So this is a model which we present where we can see flower win in the tumor and lose in the microenvironment. And uh, so going on next. 
So these are the four flower isoforms and we badly wanted to test if we can see this uh, in the cancer cells live, uh, you know, in sequential steps, for example, can we see it like a movie from the primary tumor to the same guy taking the chemotherapy and then he's going for his metastasis. What is the progression of flower wind, lose in tumor and microenvironment along the course of a patient's uh, profile? So it was easy to generate an antibody against the N-terminal region. Uh, it's extracellular, not a problem. It was also easy to generate an antibody against the WIN isoforms. So we can identify all the four isoforms by putting an antibody here. We can also make identification for the WIN isoforms by putting an antibody on exon three. But LUZ did not have a specific uh, mark. So it actually is a junction between exon two and exon four. And this region is very hydrophobic. So we couldn't generate an antibody against LUZ per se. So the strategy we adopted is that we know all the four isoforms wherever they are present, and we know the WIN wherever it is present. What is left is LUZ. So here is a demonstration in uh, colon cancer where you can see the cancer lobules and the stroma. And this is the uh, as you can see, there is very good staining in the tumor tissue and very good staining in the microenvironment tissue, both. But if we switch the antibody to the WIN phenotype, we only see excellent staining in the tumor tissue and the microenvironment is not stained. So in, again, this is the total flower and this is the wind. What is left is loose. So we have staining for loose uh, in the microenvironment. This is again demonstrated in squamous cell carcinoma, where you can see very good staining with the win antibody and then loose antibody stains overall. So we tested some uh, experiments with flower KO mice, which we generated, and we wanted to show uh, if the system has a role in manipulating or controlling the growth of tumor and metastasis. So we created a model in which uh, we have flower knockout mice, uh, which has no flower in the body and in the breast tissue, we can express flower one, two, three, four of the humans. And then we can send cancer cells from outside, which will have flower one, two, three, four. So basically we can make micro environment express win or lose, and we can have cancer cells from outside. So, as you can see here, here, the breast has flower one, which is a loose isoform and the cancer cells coming from outside also have flower one, which is the loose isoform versus this where breast has the loose isoform uh, and cells coming from outside have the win isoform. So if you compare scenario number two to scenario number, uh, scenario number five, here the breast has a loose. So the micro environment or the background tissue has a very bad fitness profile at least uh, genetically engineered bad fitness profile. And the cancer cells have the win profile and you can see the spread of the tumor and local metastasis in a very short period of time. But if we reverse the scenario and we make the breast tissue express win or good fitness profile tissue, and we have the cancer cells coming from outside which have a, a loose phenotype, the tumors are not even able to be, they cannot even be established. So uh, this again shows that Win and lose will play a major role. Again, we analyze the role of tumor microenvironment in this, uh, where in the flower KO mice versus the wild type mice, because there is no uh, flower lose present in the microenvironment of the KO mice versus the wild type mice where the lose could be produced in the microenvironment. Uh, the tumor sizes were different, and so, same was metastatic potential. We also did some experiments. Uh, to jump the hoops of the reviewers where they wanted us to show if we can rescue the phenotype. Um, and in this particular experiment, uh, you can see if we add flower when uh, isoforms back into the tumor on day 14, they kind of rescue uh, and become more aggressive and also show an increase in metastatic potential. Uh, we did some analysis by going to multiple cancers and observing what is the natural profile of a cancer to express flower win. For example, these two cancers had very high flower win and these two had low flower win. And one of this, uh, the U145 uh, HCT is a colon, ovarian, OFCAR is ovarian, and CCL2 again is a colon. This is a prostate cancer line. So we took the CCL218, which is expressing very low uh, expression of flower win per se, and we saw the rate at which it can grow the tumors. Uh, and then when we added flower uh, win isoforms to this and then created tumors, there was a big difference in the tumor uh, growth potential. 
similarly the most key experiment for this study uh, was to see the role of flower in assisting chemotherapy where we took uh, prostate to colon and ovarian cancer uh, cells uh, the prostate uh, can be uh, treated with the uh, 5-FU along with sorry, prostate and uh, cisplat uh, ovarian will be treated with cisplatin and colon will be treated with 5-FU. So chemotherapy on the regular growth potential of these tumors had an impact. But if chemotherapy was combined with flower uh, knockdowns uh, in the tumor tissue, the tumor volumes were hardly present. So it, it caused a massive regression or did not allow the tumors to be set up. So th this has a huge potential in control of metastasis as well as tumor growth. So now we are uh, at the phase where we have developed some flower uh, antibodies, po uh, polyclonal and monoclonal. Uh, this is an example of a monoclonal antibody which we have developed because we are trying to take it towards uh, monoclonal antibody therapy where uh, flower two is in RFP and flower one is in GFP and flower two should have been killing flower one. But because the system also has presence of N-terminal antibodies to block the system, we see that there is survival. So we have tested the antibodies uh, in this uh, culture system. And then very interesting results we have with uh, triple negative breast cancer xenografts, where they typically grow to this level over a course of 60 days. And then we gave them standard care of therapy for uh, triple negative, which is TAC. And these are patient derived, by the way. These are not uh, cell line xenografts. These are chunks of tumors from patients which are surgically resected and then put back in mice to grow. Uh, so essentially, this is reminiscent of what is exactly growing in a human. So the TAC uh, did not actually create a big difference in tumor growth, even though in mice. If you combine TAC with a flower monoclonal antibody, you can see there is a massive reduction in the tumor volumes. So again, uh, currently we are trying to get this done in the swine model because Swine and human flower have the exact uh, exact sequence. And swine model also presents a proper scenario of the role of tumor microenvironment or stroma because it's very easy to treat cancers in small animals. It gets difficult. So we have a follow-up discovery which is under review and uh, in a good journal, hopefully the same journal where we published last time. This is a snapshot which I can present. This is the hypothesis we are presenting that cancer cells grow by killing the epithelial and fibroblasts, mainly fibroblasts in the microenvironment. And uh, the advantages cancer cells have is that <clears throat> they are expressing flower uh, win isoforms with this exon 3 present, whereas the uh, stroma doesn't have that. So the finding which is the next step for us is that in the cancer tissue and means I hope this stays confidential uh, with the people who are listening to this webinar. And the cancer tissue, STAT3 has a binding site in the flower promoter, which produces uh, its mRNA. And from the cancer tissue, exosomes uh, are able to secrete STAT3 into the microenvironment tissue. Uh, this is uh, checked by us in the ovarian cancer sites fluid tissue. And with the exosomes releasing flower, uh, STAT3, uh, STAT3 is also creating uh, mRNA for flower in the microenvironment, but there is no decision of win or lose. There, these are just mRNAs created in both tumor and the microenvironment tissue. Uh, but now we have also find, found why there is a win or a lose. So the decision for win and lose is created by presence of exon 3, as I described before, which is present in the cancer cell and not in the fibroblasts. So the natural progression for splicing for this gene is always to include flower win. Uh, what we have found is that in the cancer cells, along with STAT3 uh, and STAT3 producing this uh, mRNA, uh, there is a long non-coding RNA generated by uh, chromosome number two. And that long non-coding RNA we have named Q-stroma because it comes from tumor and goes to the stroma, gets packaged into the exosomes by binding along with STAT3 uh, goes to goes to the microenvironment area, and so STAT3 makes the flower mRNA, and this Q stroma has the ability to go and interact with exon 3 because it uh, it has high degree of complementarity to exon 3. So it goes and binds to exon 3 and establishes a triplex structure, which results in DNA methylation followed by histone methylation, specifically H3K9, which recruits HP1 
which recruits the splice factor SRSF3. And that is the mechanism through which flower uh, exon 3 is getting spliced out specifically in the micro environment. So this, this uh, mechanism creates win in the tumor and lose in the micro environment, uh, which allows, so basically cancer is manipulating uh, its micro environment all the time. It, it is sending signals for uh, this to grow because more uh, loser cells die, better it is for the cancer. So I'm going to present only a single slide on what, what we are doing with COVID because I cannot present the data uh, without everybody who is participating in this being involved. So essentially, uh, in a young lung, we have few suboptimal cells generated all the time. And these cells undergo competition with the surrounding healthy cells. And a young lung will always maintain a tissue homeostasis. With older age, uh, most of these cells start acquiring flower loose isoforms. So competition doesn't work because most of them have flower loose. So basically, it's a carpet flower loose expression, and cell competition cannot participate much because it needs. Uh, win lose uh, ratio. So in case of a COVID-19 infection in healthy uh, people, loss of cells as unit uh, to COVID-19 infection is very, very low. Whereas in older people or people with comorbidities, which increase the expression of flower loose, there can be a carpet bombing by COVID-19 infection, where a number of lung cells will die, lice, creating microperforations, uh, release of fluid, pneumonia, and death. So currently, uh, we have enrolled close to 300 patients uh, who have been COVID negative, COVID positive with death and without death. And uh, uh, there are multiple universities and countries involved in running this biomarker assay to identify if uh, this fitness mark can predict death uh, in older adults and also with people with comorbidities. Uh, because it's very easy to say one in six or one in seven older adults will die but it gets a lot more uh, prudent to isolate those who are really are at a very high risk of death uh, and quarantines also will become easily manageable. So th that's our objective. And then objective two is also to add the flower monoclonal antibodies, which we have been developing from last two years to study if uh, that can slow uh, the process of recognition of uh, lung cells by uh, COVID and also delay its entry into the cells. With this, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our group and uh, our collaborators. The question is that you are always showing cancer cell versus fibroblasts, but why not the cancer cells, epithelial cells against epithelial cells in this co-culture? So, it doesn't work in uh, uh, retinoblastoma because it has no stroma. Uh, it's a nucleation tumor. Uh, it's in the eye. It doesn't work in uveal melanoma. But wherever we have seen juxtaposition of uh, fibroblasts, uh, epithelial cells, along with tumor cells, to variable degree, expression of flower win and lose are playing a part. So I haven't come across a system uh, which is so rampant across multiple cancer types. So that that answers that question pretty much. But I'll go back to your first uh, question or comment about uh, why it can play a role in COVID-19. Again, so we have to let data indicate what it indicates. Keeping cancer aside, there is movement of flower loose uh, along with age, along with chemotherapy. And so I can present uh, data right you see, now. You see, yes, you will answer, but you are completely unidirectional thinking. I am very critical of it because the I have written two three articles now. It is in the, it will be publishing in the very high journals soon. But my hypothesis is that those who undergo chemotherapy, radiotherapy, they are immunodeficient. Their much immunity is much uh, highly downregulated, and they are not immunocompetent at that stage. And that time this infection, but then you are not taking about, and that's why the older age people are more affected, not because of the flower. Okay. So first of all, flower has no relation with immunomodulations or immune responses. This is a cell cell based. That's what we are trying to explain in the cancer model as well. So flower system uh, expresses itself in the micro environment irrespective 
of the presence of immune cells. No. Uh, there are multiple tumor types. Some of them are immune deserted in the micro environment. They also express flower loose in the fibroblasts and epithelial cells which surround the tumor. Uh, T cells which are present uh, because th they are tumor infiltrating, uh, infiltrating lymphocytes as well as tumor surrounding uh, lymphocytes, they both express flower loose in the micro environment region. Uh, recently, there is a technology from Israel that is very stepped allogenic placental cells. It has been tried in a few patients at USA, and there is a 100% recovery even in critical places of the COVID-19. Uh, can you just explain it for our Are you talking about the plasma transfers? Yeah. So, means <clears throat> again, I will put what we are trying to do in this context, okay? Again, let's follow the procedure for the reasons for death. The reason for death is pneumonia. The killer is pneumonia. Yeah. Killer is oedema and pneumonia. So if virus is able to make micro perforations in the lung at a rapid rate before the body generates antibody. So everybody has the ability to generate antibody unless severely immunocompromised, right? It's just the fact how much time and what is the rate at which it can do so. So if you are able to supply uh, antibodies from outside, of course, create a great benefit. Even in our study, what we are trying to say is that uh, people who are dying will die, but we can just identify them better. Uh, we can create this as a biomarker uh, based on the fitness profile. And if they receive therapies, uh, for example, now I will also quote a data to you, which we just found uh, with the people uh, staff working, that uh, hydroxychloroquine is uh, creating a splice difference uh, and is promoting the expression of uh, flower win uh, and is in promoting inclusion of exon 3 in culture situations, in culture conditions. We are testing this at a rapid rate uh, right now uh, to make it more solid. So people who are receiving plasma therapy, great, they, they will respond but because ultimately the body will eliminate virus via immune system. But before that kicks in, how much damage the virus will do will depend on how many you have present in the respiratory tract. That's where we are trying to uh, answer. So people who are receiving alternate therapies, uh, what is hydroxychloroquine going to do? It's just going to buy you more time for your immune system to kick in, right? So uh, I don't see any contradiction uh, in what has been observed clinically uh, and what we are trying to do. Contrary to this, in India, a very healthy police officer of 52 years age was with a COVID problem was admitted at PGI Chandigarh and was administered this plasma therapy. And within two days, he, he did not survive. But uh, I think the news was that he didn't receive plasma therapy. That's what I read in NDTV, that uh, he was waiting for plasma therapy and they couldn't get it to him and that he succumbed. And you may call him healthy, right? But that's the point. Uh, Healthy in healthy is a very subjective word. It means we don't know how much he was. Now the data is clear uh, on on this that men are dying at two times rate of women. Can you can anybody dispute that? Right. Nobody. Right. I don't think anybody. Can, that's the data of two point five million people. People who have uh, died uh, today. I think it stands close to what? What is the number today on word meters? We can quickly check. Is there any, is there any explanation to that, Raju? Uh, explanation to what exactly? To men dying uh, double the rate of women? Yeah, means, uh, means I think there is a very clear explanation because men are uh, more of abusers in terms of uh, in terms of the you know stresses which they present to themselves. They are heavy on smoking, they are heavy on drinking, they are more prone to get cardiovascular diseases, they are more prone to have diabetes. Uh, even if you look at men to women data, this is getting increasingly clear. So uh, the question of Ragini, right? Ragini, correct? Yes, yes, Rajan. I had I had read about this in some report a few days ago, and therefore I was very inquisitive because I wanted to understand that what is the scientific basis of it. And as as I think there's there's a little difference in the in opinions, but whether it's genetic, it's more related to lifestyle lifestyles that more of these genders lead. But I think it's still debatable, is what I understand, right? 
think everything is up for debate at this time. And as I always say, data, data will indicate. So my point is that I, I don't want to bring a lifestyle to this. All I want to bring is uh, an element, which is a real element, which sells the, which is stress. So if, if you're causing chronic stress, so I'm not talking about the stress, which you have when you drive from office to work. Okay. I'm talking about chronic stress in terms of people who are constantly exposed to sunlight, high UV people who are constantly exposed their epithelial cells off. So uh, people who are suffering from uh, uh, high blood pressure will have typical stressors on epithelial cells, which are lining the vessels. Uh, people who are smoking, for example, our data clearly shows uh, from close to uh, 180 non-smokers versus close to 120 smokers, the, the expression of flower loose is significantly different. So typically what we are presenting flower loose uh, is a marker for tissue fitness. It's a marker for fitness or health status, basically. So if, if, if the assumption is true that females are a bit more careful in their life, Fine, great. But the outcome of that is that chronic genotoxic and uh, stress signals on the cells which line their respiratory tract might be lower. And that is one of the reasons that suboptimal cells in their internal organs might be at lower percentages than men. Data is data. We can't dispute the data that men are dying more than women. That's a fact.